about. <laughs> um, so basically, well, first of all, we're going to introduce everyone on the panel. I'm going to have everyone say their names, pronouns, and uh, show you what books they work on. And I will start with me. Uh, I am, I'm in all these books, which you can find at SPX, you might have heard about Queer, which is one of Ignat's last year. And this is an anthology that Rob Kirby edited, and I have a, a short piece in there. I also wrote Transposes, about queer-identified transmasculine people, uh, writing science fiction with uh, queer characters called Valley of the Silk Sky, and Politically Incorrect for people who like British comedy but want it to be more gay. <laughs> <laughs> and my pronouns are he and him. Uh, okay. I'm Anna. Um, I draw for Autostraddle. I draw for Everyday Feminism. Um, I also self-publish a lot. This is my Autostraddle comic called Grease Bats. It's about two genderqueer friends. Um, I also have like a, I use they them pronouns. I have a zine about how to use them and it's kind of like something you would throw into your office and let your coworkers read on their own time. Um, <laughs> figure it out on their own. Uh, and I also just put together um, an anthology of queers and Tinder, which we were talking about for a little bit. <laughs> for a lot. For a lot. <laughs> <laughs> which one should I use? Can I use this one? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Yao. Uh, I'm an illustrator and a cartoonist. I live in New York. Uh, I draw a comic for Autostraddle as well. This is the hard copy that I made myself. Everything's on autostraddle.com if you want to uh, read it. It's called Valpu, and um, it's about a queer bisexual migrant person named Valpu and um, things that happen in her life and thoughts that form. I printed out some large copies, so this is what it looks like in its current form. Hi, I'm Hazel. I use she, her pronouns, and here's some of my comics. Uh, I published a book called If This Be Sin, which is a collection of different comics about queer women and music. Um, yeah, there's one about Gladys Bentley, who's a, like a real drag king from the 20s. There's one about Wendy and Lisa, who were lesbians in Prince's band. I see one person is really excited about this. <laughs> so anyway, I published this. I am also the publisher and editor of Chainmail Bikini, which is comics about women gamers. And this is actually pretty queer, because a lot of people did comics about gaming, helping them explore their gender and their sexuality and stuff. So I am I'm proud that Chainmail Bikini is a pretty queer book. Um, and this is a mini comic that I made. It's called Polyglot Cunning Linguist. And this is autobiographical comics about my love life. So this one's very queer. <laughs> this one's not very queer. It's called No Ivy League, but it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Kevin J. Stanton. I use he, him. Um, I don't have any queer comics, um, but I'm curating Berlin Fur, which is uh, it's a series of pinups, um, largely about Bara, inspired by Bara. Um, and we do have some trans people that has led to interesting internet discussion um, from anonymous people, of course. And uh, but otherwise, I have a mini comic of sketches of flowers, and that's not particularly queer, but but I am, so <laughs> <laughs> that's that's me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's jump right on in here. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is that if you follow kind of comics press at all, there's a lot of talk about. Uh, you know, queer characters in mainstream comics, which are usually written by straight cis people. And there is a lot of content, you know, created by queer creators uh, out there in the world, but it's not getting quite the same attention. It's all like, but what about if Superman is gay or whatever, you know, like, so one of the things I want to talk about is, is um, how do we help readers find the queer t content that's already out there, and how do you find your audience uh, and 
you know, put the focus more on a actual queer people doing the creating rather than straight cis men writing lesbians or whatever. <laughs> lesbians or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's like everything. Right. We don't have to go in order. So. Right. No. Just whoever, if anyone is like, I want to answer this right like, now. Can I say yes. something? Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say, so the question, um, is it for publishers to find um, queer creators or t for readers to it's find It's for them? both, really, because, I mean, definitely the readers, I think, uh, come first in that, like, people are hungry for queer content. W like, I mean, I know Chainmail Bikini, you know, did well on Kickstarter, and um, the Beyond Anthology, uh, like, Spike Trotman's uh, Smut Peddler stuff that has a lot of queer content in it. Uh, when that goes up on Kickstarter, people are like, how can I give you my money? Uh, so the readers are already there wanting the content, and uh, publishers do need to catch up to that and be like, what if we published this? But yeah, how, how do we connect the readers and the creators there? Yeah, for me, I, I think sometimes for publishers, if they hire someone who's already interested in that content anyway, if you hire a queer person, hire a person of color, and they read that anyway. Like I would go home and read that every day, and I'll be like, "Hey, why don't we give them money?" That would be so much faster than like, "What do queer people do?" And they go on the internet. <laughs> like, <laughs> you can just like ask your coworker. That would be so much easier, I believe. So that's that's one way. And a lot of websites like Autostraddle, um, that's where I find queer comics to read. Or there's queer comics hashtag on Tumblr, that one I go to, or LGBTQ comics, like hashtags on Tumblr, you find a lot of stuff. And then you find one person, that person's friends, does other things, and there's a convention, like FlameCon in Park Slope. Hazel and I were there for that one, and we met a lot of other creators as well. I'm gonna say libraries are key to the queer comics takeover strategy. <laughs> because, I mean, when I was a young teen, that was my main outlet for finding stuff, and I found tons of queer characters reflected in manga, and then I pretty much went straight from that as a reader to American alternative comics. So I can't really speak to what's happening in like mainstream comics now or in the past, but yeah, I think that getting into public libraries and school libraries is gonna be like really key for all the baby queers out there to find your work. But it's hard because libraries pretty much just wanna distribute things that at least have a spine, and so there is this element of, well, somebody needs to publish it, but I don't know, maybe somebody could found an organization that takes like self-published comics from Tumblr and makes sure that they get into libraries. I don't know, somebody should be like the minister of that. That would be really amazing. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's I guess my two cents on how to connect more readers with queer comics. Um, well, for I didn't mention, but for Thousand and One Nights, um, I was gonna say like I think legitimizing is a big part of um, like we're we're gonna be creating three hardback books, and it's like there are a lot of young artists and a lot of inexperienced artists, and uh, you know we didn't say like oh you know explore queer themes in particular, but um, I think something about Lady Nights or like strong women in general, people were like yeah I really want to like dig into that, um, and it's a good intersection of legitimacy just by being hardcover, which is kind of crazy, but um, but then also you know like you're with peers and it's interlaced into kind of like the the mainstream or like the more night style comics, um, but it is strange that it has to be like hardcover, get in that library. <laughs> well, it, it makes sense from a practical standpoint, yeah. but then the libraries are like probably ordering from some major distributor rather than even knowing about all of the great stuff that's going yeah. on and all of the queer content that is being self-published but is otherwise like perfect for that market and that could really connect a lot of people with it. That should be your next anthology. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I would say at almost every show I do, I encounter at least one librarian. And 
Uh, and off, it's usually the individual, not necessarily the library system, but the individual who is like, give me the queer comics, and then they'll put it into the system. <laughs> and I've definitely seen that. And at zine fests, actually, I last zine fest I did like was crawling with librarians. So. <laughs> 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 like, um, I will also just maybe add that from like a creator standpoint and like a comic lover standpoint and as queers that we hold each other up um, as far as like recommendations and then like also like questioning anthologies, questioning conventions um, and making sure that representation is there as like either as an ally or as a fan or as a creator and you're like am I the only like trans person in this anthology, like, that makes me feel weird. I don't know. Go ahead. Sorry. Sometimes I, I think that's a great question to ask. Like, sometimes you see, like, something's kind of weird. Like, am I the only woman in this book? Or, like, you know, what does that even mean? And sometimes people don't think about it. Like, they're like, oh, you're right. That is so weird. And why do we do that? <laughs> and, and then people would change things. So I was like, do you... You know, did you just need one, like, someone who's not white to be on your book? Like, you know, you, you might want to think about that. And sometimes people just kind of forget. So if you see something that's strange, um, speak of, which I think is very helpful. And I think also watching the editors who are being really cognizant of that, like, cognizant of that, um, who are, like, reaching out to people of color and to... Uh, female non-binary creators and so on, uh, trans creators, and making sure they're included, you know those editors are going to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and like uh, Tanika Stotts and Xing Yen Kuo are two queer women who just uh, are putting together an anthology called Elements that's all people of color creators. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know there's also going to be a queer mix in there because both of the editors are queer. So you know, signal boosting that sort of thing and being like, here's here's people who are already doing inclusiveness. Don't wait for Marvel and DC to be like, oh, maybe we should hire a queer editor to come in here and yeah. do that sort of thing. I think there's a reason that we're actually referencing so many anthologies as being queer friendly, which is because that specific format, I think, really can promote basically any kind of artists that are under-recognized or are newer and don't have the body of work to fill out a whole book themselves. And like, you know, lots of individual people in Chainmail Bikini or in any of these other anthologies, like if they're just doing mini comics, they might not have that platform. So I think that kind of banding together like really works in the favor of queer people or other people who are not represented in the industry as much. Mm -hmm. Just also to add like on a, anthologies also tend to pay mm. especially now with like Kickstarter and if you want to like support queer artists you're going to want to pay queer artists. That's a good segue into oh. <laughs> <laughs> how to get paid. So this is always, <laughs> but this is an issue, like comics take a lot of time to create. And they take, uh, even if you're just, you know, scanning them and putting them on Tumblr or doing them digitally or whatever, it takes time, it takes money for the resources. And, you know, getting paid for the work is important to make that a priority in the artist's life. So the next question is getting the money to the creator. Uh, it's harder when you don't have a book to sell or if you're soliciting through Diamond and they only do one solicit and you get that, you know, however many orders you got through Diamond that one time, that's all the money you're gonna get. Um, so what are some strategies for, and I, I like the anthology thing, I think you're absolutely right. Um, the trend now, especially for uh, anthologies like Smut Peddler, like Beyond, like Elements, um, uh, Other Side is another one that's coming out soon, is to offer a good page rate to the creators, uh, which is great, but also then let's make like, even more, even more, like more than just like the, the one time you get paid for that one anthology, uh, what are some other ways to get paid? Well, I use Patreon. And I know, I don't know if everyone has an idea of what 
Patreon is. It's a website where um, people can give you money anywhere from like a dollar to five dollars to twenty five dollars a month. So it's different than Kickstarter in that there isn't necessarily like an end goal. Um, and I think it's a really useful tool to give your money to creators and then you can see like a secret sketchbook or like you get something out of it too. Um, but this is like a chunk of money that isn't necessarily going like all going to like producing a book. It's going to them living. It's going to them creating whatever they want to create. Um, and there's a lot of amazing artists who use it. I use Patreon. Yeah. Does anyone else here use Patreon? Mm -mm. So this is actually uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. really good to like I do a web comic. Well, I don't get, you know, nobody pays me money to do this science fiction webcomic, but people who want to support that work and who want to support the time that it takes to make it can be like, I'm going to give you five bucks a month, and then if you give me five bucks a month, I will send you a postcard, you know, that kind of thing of like, hey, here's a doodle I made on the postcard, mm -hmm. that, that sort of thing, and a lot of artists are really starting to get on there, uh, and that's a, it's very helpful, especially for people doing something like webcomics that's really hard to monetize. Before Patreon, um, I need to get on it, but I've been doing it sort of the old school DIY style. Just occasionally I would ask for money on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, there is, uh, I'm, what I would do is I'm, I'm sending everyone drawings and postcards if you send me your address. And on my Tumblr, there is a link that says, give me money. And if you give me some money, that would pay for the postcards. And if you give me more money, they'll pay for me drawing it. So that's, I mean, that's essentially sort of what Kickstarter or Patreon does, um, is to have the creator directly connect with their fans and then very transparently tell them what that money is going to do. Um, I also have people just, because sometimes I do comics for all those straddle and people would contact me to buy prints of it. So I do have prints of web comics that I would uh, print and sell and um, basically ship on demand, but I will charge like a middle fee for it. And people are generally okay. Um, Yao and Anna, I hope this isn't crass to ask, but speaking of payment, does Autostraddle pay for the comics that they run? Yep. Um, awesome. Yeah. I'm so glad to hear that. So yeah, that's it does uh, pay for all my haircuts. <laughs> 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 but my haircuts are good. <laughs> Okay, so since you two have more spoken to the persistent funding models, I was actually lucky enough to get a Prism Comics queer press grant for this book a couple of years ago. So that was very helpful, but unfortunately there's just one and it just happens once a year and if there was, you know, 10 queer press grants or even 100, it probably wouldn't be enough to like recognize and support everybody who's doing great work. But um, grant writing is cool, though. I, I would encourage anybody who's interested in getting funded that way to think broadly and think about, of course, comic-specific grants, but also anything that applies to queer people. Um, I believe there's a, the Leeway grant, I think, is out of Philly, and I think that's... <laughs> All right, the Leeway Grant is here, and they do grants for, is it just trans women? It's women and trans artists. Women and trans artists for social change. So you could look into organizations like that that aren't specifically comics targeted, or, I mean, comics are visual and written. So I've heard really good things about people who try to get, like, grants for writers with comics because the people looking at it will be like, oh, I've never seen something with pictures before. <laughs> so, yeah, that um, that's definitely an angle. And grant writing and kickstarting something are in a way very similar because you have to have this proof of concept and come across like, hey, I'm really going to get this done. I have the power and the experience to make this. But... Kickstarter, you get a little bit from lots of people who believe in your project, and grant writing, you just need like one person or a committee to buy into what your vision is, and 
So yeah, that's another option. I, uh, I actually have like no experience with this. Um, <laughs> for me, I, uh, I think that being queer has not been a huge part of my life, being an illustrator primarily and not a comic artist, but I've been very lucky that I'm working with an editor at a publisher right now that um, she was like, pitch me ideas, and I, I had a random idea, but um, it's kind of a, a metaphor for me having come in, out to my brother. Um, and it's interesting to work with kind of a, a larger publisher and, and know going in that they're Potential. I mean, it's pretty. It's not like racy, but um, but you know, it is explicitly about um, coming out as gay and, and my own brother's reaction. Not a bad reaction, but um, but kind of about that. So, I mean, for me, it's interesting to see like being sort of outside of it, the sea change of hopefully like okay, like it's not even a question, ideally, you know, where it's like it's cool, just just write it, but. Um, but no, I, I've heard Patreon, I've seen supported queer Patreon that seems like one of the better, uh, the better kind of ways to get it directly, so. Um, I also work as an illustrator and that's, that's a form of income and I didn't mention it because it's not directly from readership to creator, but there are times where um, the, other, the other month I did a, like a 10 page comic about street harassment that lesbians encounter for BuzzFeed. And they hired me to do it because they saw comics that I did of a lesbian couple fighting <laughs> on my <laughs> website. And they're like, I love the style and you have personal experience um, because a lot of editors and art directors do look for an illustrator who does have personal knowledge of the subject matter. Uh, so that's one way, if you're a creator, that's one way to get money although not directly from your readership, but that goes into media and that influences the exposure of issues and people would want to give more money to queer creators and that also feeds into the good cycle. I definitely want to talk also about <clears throat> um, how privilege affects our uh, work as career creators. So one of the issues that comes up periodically is that, I mean, kind of by virtue of being a comics creator who's doing queer comics, you more or less have to be out. Like you have to have the privilege to be out sitting up on a table in front of an audience talking about your stuff or being online and promoting your work. It's very difficult to do that if you're in a situation where uh, you know, being out is not an option, or if you have to go anonymous, or uh, how privilege, you know, like how queer culture in general privileges whiteness over um, people of color. So I want to talk a little bit about how, uh, you know, other factors that you, that you want to throw into that discussion, and maybe how current queer comics culture can change some of that. Um, well, I, I have an interesting relationship because I think that um, because my work is not particularly queer, um, I had an interesting situation where I was commissioned by a gay couple to do just a, it was like a anniversary present for them and it was kind of my awakening to my own latent privilege passing as, if not straight, ambiguous um, because not only was he very bashful about asking, you know, trying to broach it like, oh, like, I don't know if that's cool. And I was like, it's totally cool. Like, that's fine. But when I posted the piece online, I had trepidation because it was the first time I had said like, oh, you know, I did this and it's like for a, a gay anniversary, like whatever. And um, I got an anonymous message immediately. <laughs> and I, of course, was like, this is it. This is the, <laughs> this is the hate mail I've been waiting <laughs> for. <laughs> And instead, and almost worse, I, it was someone saying like, thank you so much for, for doing that. And I was so taken aback because I was like, in my head, I was like, of course, you know, because, because I have a boyfriend, like I would love to, and it was like an awesome commission. Um, but it was an interesting awakening for me because I realized that despite feeling, you know, like I'm 
I'm not like guarded online about anything, but um, but at least on Tumblr, apparently I had been kind of latently privileged from, <laughs> from that, and uh, so I didn't actually get any hate from that, which was great. But but it was interesting to kind of find out that I, had not being particularly vocal, I had been kind of uh, just assumed straight, I guess. So um, and I wonder how much that's affected potentially work or, or not, but, um, but with Berlin Fur, that's kind of been my, my crazy, like, this is happening, you know, <laughs> like, it's all sexy dudes, basically, um, and, but it's been, for me, like, really interesting because it's the first time I've really expressed queerness directly, um, and it, I do go into it with a little bit, like, oh my god, I can't believe I'm doing this, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> Um, like now that even that it's that explicit, it's like a pinup at best. But um, but I do I do find myself increasingly curious about kind of um, you know what have I benefited from potentially um, not not having been particularly out I guess. Um, I was actually I never made comics. I wasn't really making comics at all. And then the first. A uh, Valpo comic I made, um, I actually literally made it. Like, I didn't even talk to Aldo Straddle yet. Um, I, it was about me coming out to my mom on Skype. And it was pretty, like, afterwards, like, my first reaction was like, you shouldn't have done it. Like, it was just, like, completely wrong. It was like, everything that I've read about people saying you should come out, it was like, no one should come out ever. Like, <laughs> I just, just don't do it. And then to me, like, it was kind of a shock, and it was a little, um, I came to the realization that a lot of the queer comics or queer content I create are from people with everyone has different cultural backgrounds and family backgrounds, and the level of tolerance is like, it's probably drastically different, and then there's like so little info on it, I don't know how different they are, and judging from my own family's reaction must be really bad. So for me, it was like, well, you know, like I had no information, so maybe now I have information, I need to, like if I put an L, maybe there's another like queer Asian person out there. Like maybe when they read it, they will know how bad it is, and they can make a judgment whether like they should come out or not. Because like sometimes there's like this universal like everyone's like you should just like do what's right for yourself. It's awesome. I was like that's because most like 70% of people are actually okay later. I was like maybe it's not okay later. And actually, the latest Auto Straddle comic I just did, I haven't sent it to the editor yet. It's about how. Like, I'm out to part of my family, but it's, you know, it's not the, like, the kumbaya moment of, like, end of a queer movie, like, everyone's happy about it. So it's just, like, a very, uh, like, I had to wrote it in pictures and words because it was, like, a sentiment that's really hard to describe. It just became, like, a shared secret um, between family members, and it was like, you know, no one ever told me that was gonna happen, uh, which was why I decided to, I wrote my comics, um, some of them I wrote like eight in like one sitting because they were, um, they were fairly simple, they were like, it started like this at first, they were just on copy paper, um, before they got really elaborated, and then I decided to pitch it to Auto Straddle. Um, that was just a, a cold call. I didn't know anyone there before. And I wrote a really, really long email. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I also have done illustration work for Katy Perry, and then they published an article that week about how much they hate Katy Perry. And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote another like long paragraph about, you know, it's good to have people who need work and need represented in pop culture to work for pop culture so we can change the industry from the inside. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, like, don't hate me because I worked for someone you right. hate. Um, so that's, that's how I started doing comics in general, really, like, regularly. And now I'm on this panel, which it's really crazy. I've done like I've just done the twelve issues, so I really only have twelve of them. Yeah. Um, I don't have like a lot to add, um, but there is a comic on everyday feminism by my friend Ronnie, 
um, called Why I'm a Successful Queer Cartoonist. And um, I recommend, if I try and like reiterate it, I'm gonna miss some vital points. But I recommend everyone reading it. It speaks to my experience a lot about like why I might be like considered a successful queer cartoonist, you know. So just look it up. I, I think I paneled with Ronnie at oh, yeah. San Diego. Cool. Uh, and one of the things that I've noticed um, writing, like doing comics and publishing comics as a trans guy, when I transpose this is where I interviewed people, but I present them all anonymously. These are just, you know, trans folk that I interviewed for this. And I presented it anonymously because a lot of the people who are out as trans are taking the risk of being public about it uh, and knowing that that affects their lives, like how their relationships with their families, their abilities to get jobs. Uh, and I wanted stories about people who didn't necessarily feel like they were in a safe space to be out as trans in public and having their face plastered all over the internet. Uh, and I have definitely noticed at shows when I'm selling this book, um, not so much at places like S X SPX, where I feel like there's a vibe of being very supportive of queer people, but at other shows, uh, more mainstream comic shows, I will see people kind of, and this even with not just trans stuff, but with just queer comics in general, there will always be someone who's kind of walking past the booth, kind of like trying not to let their friends see that they're looking at the queer comics, oh uh, or someone who is like, you know, have the trans dar going on of like, mm, that's probably, but not necessarily feeling safe coming up and reading the book. Um, and I do think the internet helps a lot with distributing to people who otherwise don't feel safe. The flip side of that is, like I, I have a trans woman friend, cartoonist, uh, Sophie LaBelle, who does the cutest, sweetest comics about trans experience and gets the most vituperative hate mail. So, you know, it, it's one of those things where, again, like having the privilege of being out, having the privilege of uh, kind of being shielded somewhat from that sort of thing, it definitely seems to me that it's more directed at femmes, more directed at trans women. Uh, anyone who kind of presents as female, it seems to be a pile on almost. Uh, I, I hear that more from, and I hear it, I don't hear it so much from cis men who are creating queer comics or from trans guys who are creating queer comics, uh, which is another interesting kind of shade of this, like who, who is allowed to be criticized, basically. And then if you want to create queer comics, you then have to make the decision of do I want to take on that, do I want to risk that? Do I want to put that out there and then risk having people I was gonna say that bef before I made I certain like in my mind I shouldn't be making out queer comics before I come out as queer and then that's why for the longest time I didn't make any comics because when you're in college like a, like a lot of people who make indie comics it's just comics about dating and then I was like I if I can't write about dating I can't write about anything <laughs> so. <laughs> And then, like, if I don't tell people about dating, then, I, you know, there's nothing else to talk about. So <laughs> then, so there was just no comic. And I kind of had to go through the process. It's like, okay, I am even L to my family, and now somehow I'm justified to make queer comics now. I wonder if it's necessary. Like, just, like, in my mind, that's, like, a moral, like, uh, it's just, like, a hoop that I had to jump through. Um, and also I'm shielded from my family, like everyone I know being in a different country. So I, and I work in a, like I work in arts, which is highly forgiving and encouraging of anyone who's out and weird. So that's definitely a privilege. I basically don't have the risk of someone coming up and be like, hey, like what's that about? Like no one ever asks me that, which is, which is great. And another thing, when you mentioned the thing about femmes, I only have one thing to add, just that sometimes when I'm more like more like masculine passing, it's kind of horrible because 
like I think as an Asian woman, there was like the Asian woman trope, and then as like an Asian masculine passing person, I was like, no one gives a shit about you. All of a sudden, like I wrote a comic on all the straddle about it. Like people would just like shove you on the street, like because you were just like a like not important, not intimidating, and not attractive person. And I was like, this is like the worst thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> and, like as like most of the time, uh, more feminine passing it, it's like night and day and then i wouldn't call that privilege it's just like the when you fall into different cracks of fetishization like magical things just happen to you um i just want to say i think it's really awesome to be addressing how privilege affects making comics period um and I'm I'm not sure how I've somehow avoided getting any flack like in person or online or anything for being out as a queer creator, but um, I think for me where privilege really does come into it is because I have had the choice like throughout my life so far to choose the comics that I work on and choose to create my own stuff rather than having to be like, I need to get hired right now, so who's gonna let me draw something? I've been able to like, you know, have, have the time and space and money to start my own stuff. And so I guess, I have the privilege of like being able to actually follow my heart and like create stuff that's about queer women. Awesome. And I very quickly actually want to touch a little bit on the book that you brought up with uh, about this one here, leaving your they them pronouns book out for people to see. Do you do you find that it is kind of a struggle to get people to respect your pronouns. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's addressed in the zine, like all the points that people make about why they can't use they, them pronouns, or any like in, any non-binary pronoun, like it's not just that, uh, not just those. Um, and it is frustrating, and it is hard, it is hard to come out to your family as, you know, as like, oh yeah, if you could just use this, it, it makes you feel like, you're a bother, and um, the same goes for at work, and it sucks to be at a place for like, you know, six, eight hours a day, and then be misgendered. Mm. Um, so one way I combating that without actually combating it is just me putting it in a public place at work and then leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Where did this come from? <laughs> Who made it? <laughs> out my name. Right. <laughs> All right, so we're getting pretty close to Q&A time, so think about your questions. And we're gonna have people line up at this microphone here and speak loudly into the microphone to address your questions to the panel. Uh, is there anything else anyone wants to jump in and add, like a burning thing that you have to say about being queer comics creator? <laughs> Um, I remember you had this question on the list that I was really excited about, about like something about feeling queer enough oh, oh, right. as oh, I do want to ask be that out one. and stuff. Okay, yes, let's do that one. Um, do you feel an obligation to make your stuff gay enough in order to count as queer comics? <laughs> do you feel that obligation? Yes, well, that's <laughs> definitely uh, something that I think about a lot. I mean... Aside from, aside from this book, which is about other people, most of my work is autobiographical, and a lot of it touches on relationships, and I'm bi, so it's kind of, you know, a toss-up whether my stuff is going to be about a relationship with a woman or a relationship with a man. And then, um, yeah, I... For whatever reason, it's really important to me that people know that I'm not straight. So I worry about somebody picking up something like this, which doesn't like really address the queer side in it, and then making that assumption. 
And I think I sort of combat that through my social media presence. I kind of think of Twitter as like an extension of being a cartoonist, especially if you're doing autobiographical stuff because it's just all this weird mishmash where you're like selling your work and promoting yourself, but also people are in some sense interested in you as a person or interested in your personality. So. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I worry about like bi erasure or not feeling queer enough. So sometimes I'll tweet like about like some guy that's attractive and I'll be like, hashtag no hetero. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess I try to let people know, but depending on which book of mine they pick up, they might come away with different assumptions about me. I was really excited by that question as well because that definitely I consider it every time I do a comic specifically for Auto Straddle just because it's is part of the website's content as part of the branding and my comic it's it is on queerness but at the same time some of it is cultural identity confusion uh, but sometimes it's just it's just a sad comic <laughs> so that I was trying to in the first couple of them like let people establish like these couple of points so sometimes I don't feel like every single one of them have to be like this is about queerness because I, I'm I'm a firm believer of that like queerness in media should be my ideal is that people are just people having relationships and living lives and queer dating is just dating. And <laughs> there are p definitely parts about discomfort and coming out and how to explain it to your family and friends, like the general like queer side of things. But there are definitely a lot of just the relationship side of things. And I think as a queer person, it's my right to just make a relationship comic or just like a sadness comic, like I'm just a person with feelings and that's that's all of it. I'm not talking about anything social justice related because once in a while you just need to have that personal space to remember that you're just a person that writes things. Uh, and before uh, before I knew about the definition of queer or bi or any boxes that you can check, you're just someone who likes people and writes about it. And I think that's that's my take. I kind of once in a while bring it in. Um, for me, like I said, I mean, it's kind of my new burgeoning identity. So um, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to, I mean, with illustrations, it's not like, you know, not, uh, I'm getting commissioned to do like portraits of other people, I can't necessarily like somehow inject queerness into, yes. into that Elliot Smith portrait, but um, <laughs> like, this but is actually about did. me. <laughs> it's about heroin, but it's also about me. Um, <laughs> but, but I mean, um, I'm trying to figure out like at what point, like yeah, this, what you said, yeah, like I wanna be, um, even if I, I do publish this comic, you know, and it's about coming out to my brother, I don't, um, I'm trying to figure out how much I want to kind of be dominated by like, I am a queer cartoonist versus, um, you know, as an, a, an occasional expression that I can kind of gauge on my own. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to figure that out. I, I don't know where, the, <laughs> where that line is, so. Right, I think um, the obligation to make things like gay enough comes from just like the self-doubt of like, am I queer enough? Am I gender queer enough? Am I trans enough? Like, just like carrying around those doubts into your work and like, um, and then just being like really unsure about your voice. Um, I would say most of my work is like pretty heavily influenced by my queer lifestyle and um, I like it that way. And I, I, I don't know. Love you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Feedback. Yeah, I, I, I feel like sometimes I have a little bit of an obligation to make things trans enough because there aren't that many 
out trans cartoonists. Um, there's a certain, it's, a, it's kind of a weird situation where sometimes writing about trans topics can actually trigger dysphoria for me, so it's actually fairly uncomfortable. But I also want to try to push past that and be like, but here is stuff for people to look at and relate to. Um, and I'm act the, some of the characters in, in my sci-fi comic are asexual, and I also, there's not very many people writing about asexuality right now, so I do feel like I want to talk about that, but I don't necessarily want to have the characters sit down and be like, well, you're asexual, why so am I? Let's talk about it. <laughs> like, that would be super boring. So, you know, it's, it, so I want it to be there, and I want it to be, you know, you know, overtly part of the canon, but I don't necessarily want to be like, here's the obvious club and beat you over the head with like some really didactic stuff that's going to take you out of the story. But part of that, I think, just comes from the lack of visibility of these topics in the first place. Like if it were just, if there was more of it out there, it might feel less like you have to do it. Yeah, there was something that I read last week that I really liked from either it was I think it was like a New York Times or a New Yorker article. It was really, really good quote. It said that um, in literature, um, it happens that people of margins literature are defined by their trauma, which I was like, it explains everything that I think is wrong about like making queer comics or making like Chinese people comics or whatever. Like that thing is people just want, I was like, if I just made comics, like would that have been okay? Like is that, the only reason, you know, all of a sudden people want to read it is because I brought something that's really raw, you know, it's really rare, it's really cool to the table, but if not, am I still a good writer? Am I a good illustrator? And people kind of just don't tell you that, which is why sometimes I do test the water by not making it very straightforward, queer, so that it wouldn't necessarily make it into the very obvious pile of these are LGBT comics. And then is it still a good comic? Does it still offer something to everyone? Because I, I believe that queer comic creators are also just great, good creators. And if straight creators can bring something that's just universal sentiments to everyone, like everyone has the right to do that. So I, I sometimes just purposely leave it out. It is time for Q&A. Do we have any cues that need to be aid? <laughs> I thought everyone was leaving. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Hi. Um, I have a question. Um, you brought up asexuality, and that kind of leads right into my question, which is like, um, do you ever feel like, like especially like as a trans person writing about like trans stories, um, like, do you ever feel like your, like, comic or your characters are, like, too inaccessible and you have to, like, take time to explain, like, like, bringing up, like, pronouns is, like, such a pain in the ass and, like, especially if it's they, them, and it's, like, do you feel like, like, if you have a character that has, like, something like that that's like, not even, like, a lot of queer people may be so educated on, do you feel like that's a barrier and, like, how do you get over that? It's always a challenge to write something in a way that is not painfully didactic, because I really hate that kind of thing. And that's a personal preference for me, though. I do know people who enjoy that kind of work. And I think there's a place for it, especially if you're talking, if you're trying to do one-on-one -on -one stuff, you know, like you're coming out to your grandma and you need to explain the concept of, you know, there being more than two genders or whatever. Sometimes that kind of thing is, is good for that. But for, for my own writing, where I'm really trying to connect with people who are already having those feelings, I try to kind of weave it in as subtly as possible. And, uh, and I enjoy stories that are told out of order. So you don't find, like, you, you won't read the first part of the story having knowing all the pieces of information you need to know. And I think that's a good setup for working in stuff like that, because you're already going in with the expectation that not everything's going to be explained to you right away. And you're going to have to wait to get the pieces that you want. Yeah, as far as like uh, characters that have different pronouns, I just do it. And then I've never had someone be super confused by it. Like after a couple like pages, they don't even remember. Like they just roll with it. Um, 
and it's not a thing where I want to like explain something about the characters' lives. I just want the characters to live on as characters, as like doing whatever they do. And I've never had someone be like, "This is inaccessible to me because I don't understand these alternative alternative <laughs> pronouns." They're like, "This is inaccessible to me because your characters are gross people." Like I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Hello, I think this is kind of one of those overall it's asked a lot questions, but I still think it's pretty important. For you guys as comic consumers, what was the first like real queer comic title or um, comic with queer characters in it that really kind of hit home for you? Um, just any title or any particular character, really? I don't know if you guys have heard of Alice and Bechtel. <laughs> <laughs> She's really... <laughs> But, uh, but that was actually like, uh, I mean, I'm like 40 years old. So when I was in college, uh, I picked up a copy of the, and I grew up in Texas in a very conservative state, or a very conservative part of uh, the state. So the, the idea of queerness wasn't even on my radar for much of my growing up. Um, and it was not until I went to college and I picked up a copy of some queer newspaper and I was like, what is this dykes to watch out for comic? <laughs> so, I mean, an obvious answer, but for me that was yeah. defi definitely one of the first ones where I was like, you can do that, so. Yeah. I read a lot of manga in high school <laughs> and um, there's a lot of like l lesbian undertones in a lot of those friendships, yeah. so. That Just a cousin. <laughs> 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 yeah, I like that. Yeah, so that's for me. For me too, when I, when I was in like third grade, I read a lot of clamp um, Japanese <laughs> group. And then like I could completely like, I grew up just after that, I was like, what is gender anyway? <laughs> it just very, very much so like, it just cute people falling in love. And I was like, that should be like that all the time. <laughs> and then when later when you're not in elementary school anymore, I felt like the idea of like what a straight couple looks like really hit home, not just for me, I think for a lot of kids and like how much everyone accepts the artificial ideal. I think everyone made a choice at that point going forward. I don't think everyone just started with what they know about like what a normal couple look like and that just looks like a straight couple and then somewhere in their life they suddenly became queer. I think a lot of people started as queer and like it just assimilated into another idea of what, what straight looks like. So for me that's that and for American comics it was uh, Erica Moen. Uh, I loved it so much. Like now I read it, I forgot like the whole time of Dar, she was dating a guy. And then I just like couldn't, like in my memory, that was just so non existent. <laughs> but that was my first for American comics. Uh, I'm going to third this sentiment about manga. I think the one that stands out for me was Cardcaptor Sakura when Tomio has that unrequited crush on Sakura. Um, I, there was also like a two ladies in Nagima, if anyone read that, that I really, I don't even remember their names though, but uh, that, that has a big cast, so no shade to Nagima that I can't remember. But um, yeah, and Alison Bechdel, and also shouts out to Love and Rockets and Maggie and Hopi, amazing queer couple written by a straight dude, but... Uh, I'm not, I'm not mad at that representation. <laughs> and uh, also, Strangers in Paradise was really excellent. And yeah, those were some of the early ones that, oh my gosh, and, uh, and Lost Girls, that's like my root, <laughs> if anyone knows what that means. And yeah, those are some of the ones I liked. Uh, for me, I think, um, I mean, really like, <laughs> Like Sailor Moon. <laughs> like, <laughs> like not I mean, I'm pretty new to comics in both consumption and, and creation. Um, so for me it was definitely like anime style, like, you know, finding out their cousins or brother and sister in the <laughs> weirdest way, like that doesn't make it better. But you know, being, <laughs> being kind of curious about that. Um, and actually I think Fun Home was probably the first time I had seen um, oddly given to me by a Mormon feminist, and she's super awesome, um, and she gave me it as a birthday present last year. 
and I, I read it like in one sitting, basically, like on the subway home. And uh, I think it was the first time that I had really seen like the real life queer representation. And, uh, and I was like, oh my God, this has like redefined what I think of as, you know, um, not being too didactic, but like exploring it. So um, yeah, I thought that was, that was fantastic. Thanks. Awesome. Hello, so I figured there's probably quite a few aspiring queer cartoonists in this room. So I'd like to ask the panel, who probably have more knowledge of this than me, because I'm a superheroes fan, shameless, what sort of queer content are we not seeing enough of? What do we need more of? What kind of characters and plot lines? Where's the gap? Where are the gaps? Where, where are the places where a young creator could potentially go where there isn't really anyone going there right now? I mean, it feels to me like a lot of the queer comics that have been done are slice of life or autobio stuff, which is important and good. Uh, but it also, like, we get to a point where, like, can we, can we have, you know, a gay Superman? Or can, uh, you know, like genre fiction... Horror would be great to see. Um, basically, anything that kind of gets a little bit beyond just like here's a modern day, you know, middle class queer experience. I've been reading Midnighter, um, which is kind of an interesting. Like, it's just not a thing, but he's, you know, at one point he has. They like have ruined that character. <laughs> 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 I'm only new to the series, so I cannot speak to that. But, um, but no, I mean, yeah, I think that that's it's interesting to me to just see like it's just it's just a part of his character, like in the superhero context, as opposed to it being very like slice of life. I wish there were. I hope there are more comics. Like the pile that I'm putting into is I wrote in one comic so that I don't know who I'm writing for. And then that's easily mistaken by me saying I'm writing this for myself. But I'm really writing it for someone that I don't know who these people are. Because when I was looking for queer content for someone who's not from somewhere that's highly religious, middle class, and white, and also queer, like that's, like that's only one version of the story. I, and I only realized that later. And I wish there was some, um, like, what if there's like, um, like American Chinese, but it's a queer book, or like, if someone can give me another movie that's not Saving Face, I would watch it like <laughs> a, a, another 500 times. Like, there were days where I'm just like, I'm just gonna drink some wine and watch Saving Face, but I can watch another movie that would be great. So yeah. something similar, like Slice of Life, but in another. Yeah. In another segment, basically, another demographic, more slice of life for that. Like, how are you supposed to live and hit on someone at a bar? Like, that would be great. <laughs> Gosh, I don't know what to add to all of those great suggestions for more queer comics that should exist. So I think I want to read more comics that are about non-white queer people's experiences or not middle class or like not where that's just a facet of the character and it's not necessarily all about coming out or realizing your identity or whatever which is you know great but then move beyond that um i guess one thing i think would be really awesome is seeing more stuff just generally with like established couples working through shit rather than something that emphasizes like you get together and then once the two people realize they like each other it's like that's it um yeah just stuff i mean i don't think i could ever get bored with like real world or reality based or autobiographical comics even i mean i dig the horror and fantasy stuff but i think even within just the everyday, there is there's an infinitude. Yeah, I don't have anything to add, like genre-wise, that maybe needs to be 
um, included, although I do think that there is a gap creator-wise, especially getting paid creator-wise with trans women in comics, um, specifically trans women creators, and they're out there. Annie Mock is amazing. Um, Jessica, who does Manic Pixie Nightmare Girls. Mm. Um, like, there are these amazing creators, but I don't think that they're nearly as well known mm -hmm. enough. And um, I think it's a gap at conventions. It's a gap in a lot of art and websites. And I don't know. It, it, can, it can be filled. I can think of one black trans woman uh, comics creator um, who doesn't do conventions and doesn't yeah. publish online. And it's like, it's very difficult to find. Um, and part of that, again, has to do with do you feel welcome at these? Yeah. Are you reached out to? So, um, yeah, reaching out to. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello. I wrote mine down. Oh, so smart. <laughs> Are there any ways to include less visible queer identities, such as the earlier mentioned asexual character or like aromantic characters and like other identities, such as people who have lots of disabilities and are also queer or like like earlier mentioned, people of color who are queer. And I have a friend who is a uh, deaf trans man who is doing comics about being deaf and trans. And uh, he's publishing online a lot of his stuff. And again, this is, we get back to Tumblr, like you tag it uh, deaf, trans, queer, and that's one way to find uh, something around that. But it's not really, I, I know he tags stuff a lot with deaf talent, so I think that um, it's something, again, that's very difficult to find in any kind of mainstream context, uh, but finding stuff where, where people have been like, you know, I'm going to put this online and I'm going to tag it and you can find it with my tags, you know. Having a, a more centralized thing for that would be good. There, I mean, Prism Comics does do, uh, like you can go on there and browse by profile, but I think it's a little hard to search. Like if you're like, show me all of the asexual creators doing stuff with asexual comics or disabled creators or whatever, it's, it's not as easy to find stuff that way. But yeah, Tumblr and tagging. Also, shout out to the Queer Cartoonists Database, which is oh, run yeah, by yeah, Mari yeah. Naomi. That, it's, I'm, it's by no means comprehensive because people have to I believe, submit themselves to it and then fill out what's my comic or what do I want to say about my identity. But um, yeah, that's another way to come across stuff. And she also, I think, does the cartoonists of color database mm -hmm. and then there's overlap if you want to look at like uh, queer cartoonists of color or non-male cartoonists of color or all of these things. So. Yeah, and if anybody out there is a queer creator or a creator of color who isn't already in there, this is, you should uh, do it. <laughs> do it, y'all. <laughs> right on. Sometimes, like, for, ace, especially for asexual identity, because I have some relating sentiments of that, like, it might just be that it's not about sexuality because because like sometimes like, because if you are asexual like it's just not because when you have an asexual friend that's a friend who doesn't talk to you about sleeping with people and then you can't be like tell me about what it's like to not sleep with people they just want to talk about their days because that's how it is and you have a friend who like did not grow up with the same pop culture as you are that's the friend who says nothing during a discussion about Cartoon Network in the 90s like it's not <laughs> Like they can't write about how, unless someone asks them, then they will be like, oh, okay, now that you ask, I can tell you what I feel like. But people just get on with their days. So if a creator doesn't talk about it, maybe look into like what they doesn't, what they don't talk about, and that's that's one way of coming across content. I I I'm learning. I okay. have nothing to add. <laughs> I will also say as a creator to make sure that you get out of your comfort zone with your art and then also out of your comfort zone with your like social circles that you're hanging out with. Like if you're hanging out with the same queer people who maybe you know, you're good friends with because you have a lot of similarities, then maybe it's time to like try out a new event, a new venue and uh, like talk to the people that are actually like a part of your community. 
Thank you. All right. Uh, so I, I have to take off pretty soon. Uh, they did let us run over the panel a little bit long because we're the last panel of the day. Um, but come up. Uh, we'll do these last two questions, and then we got we to gotta book. OK, I just um, wanted to ask you guys uh, about how you either feel that your own work or that the work of the whole, like what you could call the queer comic scene is at addressing, say, intergenerational issues, like talking to the past and like creators and like events that have happened in like queer and LGBT history, as well as like kind of cross contamination. Because I know in like a lot of discussions that I've had with uh, activist friends, like they know very strongly that a lot of people who are like under like 25 don't really like know about anything that happened like pre 1999. <laughs> This comes up a lot with the trans star, trans asterisk uh, construction, which 15 years ago was the progressive way of trying to be inclusive and is now uh, deprecated. Um, but I've had some friends get their necks jumped on for using trans asterisk, and it's like, by people who are in the kind of under 25, it's like, how could you do that? That's the worst thing anyone could ever do. And it's like, that changed. Like there was a shift. Uh, this the amount of time ago we had this discussion about it, and it was subtle. You know, we thought that this was the right thing to do, and then other voices came in and said, "Actually, this isn't working for us." And you know, uh, here are the reasons why. And it's like, okay, those are good reasons. Okay, let's change it. But not everyone gets the message at the same time, and that does. It is good to have cross dialogue because you do get a point where like. It, it almost feels like the younger people are doing their thing and the older people are doing their thing and everyone's kind of like, why are you doing this weird thing? Uh, but, you know, kind of people have often good input to have into that. And the Queers and Comics conference that happened in New York earlier this year was a really good um, crossover of, like, the young under 25 creators with the older creators who are in their 60s and whatnot. And you had, that was a great place to sit down and have people just talk with each other in a face-to-face -face way about those sorts of things. And I'd like to see more of that populate into other uh, queer comic spaces. Yeah, I think like queer history is so rich and so vibrant <coughs> and so just like so important um, that I think it goes back to like people needing to talk to these people, especially uh, age is a weird thing and like a lot of younger folks have a, like weird hangups about it or about maybe going out and talking to someone who's like 50 years their senior. Um, I will say that, and I don't have all the details, maybe you do about the Kickstarter right now, that, nope, okay. Uh, there's a Kickstarter going on right now about um, queer historical fiction. Um, it's what? Dates. Dates? Yeah. That's what it's called. Yeah. Oh, oh, I saw that one. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's called Dates. <laughs> okay, I didn't have all the information, but I spoke anyway, so. Um, so something is being created, but not by me. I, I grew up with my mother as a feminist researcher, or at a time uh, used to research a lot of queer culture in the history of China, which is very niche and it's kind of amazing that I just like born into like bookshops about queer people. Uh, so it was, pretty amazing and just to know the history of it and then there are so many people who don't know uh, and then also there's like a cultural divide like what happened in america and what happened in other parts of the world and what happened in other parts of the world before the missionaries got to them it's very fascinating so it, it, i i come to especially like the word queer is relatively new I like that word, but it also gives me a sense that the history of how people define themselves is constantly evolving. And I use queer because it, it is the latest one and it's the one that fits um, with me the most. And I think it's also the, the latest definition of there's more fluidity to what you identify with. And I'm under the belief that everyone, everything's evolving still all the time. So having that conversation with older generations is important and also with newer generations. Like maybe people don't identify as queer as much sometimes because that no longer fits what they believe 
they are. So I think maybe like under, like the even younger generation, like they can also join the discussion. Like that would be really interesting. I think when it comes to comics about like about older queer people or about queer history, um, one of the problems that we run into is partly that comics is kind of a young person's game often in that it doesn't pay a lot and so it can require sort of all of this energy to do it. And you know, a lot of people at a certain point uh, give up on that or decide that they want to do something more financially stable. So I think that's kind of creating a gap where we don't have a lot of older queer people directly making comics about their experiences. But um, yeah, I think that anybody who's younger who wants to do something that's historical fiction or historically based can totally do it if that's where their interest is at. I mean, I had a great time researching uh, historical queer figures for this book. Um, and I also, a while ago, took part in a project where we interviewed this queer activist who's, I think, in her 80s named Kathleen Sadat, and I did the illustrations. So that was a really great experience to um, like contact, make direct contact with somebody who's a part of queer history rather than having to like take received information. But yeah, I think any young person who wants to write about that absolutely can and uh, it probably takes, like Anna was saying, going out of your comfort zone socially a little bit to actually meet those people and get that experience or doing some research also. I really had no experience. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Last one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um. So uh, I just first want to say that I'm really glad that you said disabled people, because that means a lot to me. And second, um, this was already sort of asked, but more about queer people that are also disabled and making com comics about that and visibility with that, whether or not the disability is visible or not. The Queers and Comics Conference had a panel on queers and disability at it. Uh, and it was recorded, uh, it's on the CLAGS website, C-L-A-G-S, uh, so you can watch that online. I would like to see something like uh, Mari and Naomi's databases for the uh, uh, creators of color and, and, uh, and queer creators that is a, a, a central place to talk about, for queer people to talk about disability, because it it's, it's hard to get to a convention if, you're, if you have certain types of disability. Um, and have that be more part of the dialogue. So, uh, and I know, I mean, it, it, it's it's been very uh, um, good for me to to see like uh, 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 my my trans deaf friend. Um, he, he Caro Doodles is I think his the name of his website. So, yeah, like getting it out there, but having something that centralizes it more so people can find it would be great. I believe it will be great if we can um, have, because there are, there are certain experiences that are hard to talk about and to write about and then to present to public. And that itself is a difficulty that's beyond actually just writing or just thinking about it. So I believe it would be great to have creative workshops for every group that that might be like everyone who's abled and queer can probably know by this point how to write an autobiography comic. You think about what you did and you write about it. But there are certain parts where you stop. You're like, I don't, I don't want to share that, or I don't know how to word that. No one ever told me how that was worded. I don't know how to describe it. It would be great to get creators together or whoever's interested and to have a support group and to work that together or to talk about it together so that people can have a better mechanism of just making it in general and then make it and then there will be 
of higher quality too, and they can get more exposure. And once this workshop happens, they could make an anthology out of it, and that is <laughs> right. could be the method of uh, distributing these works to a wider audience. But yeah, that's definitely um, an experience that I haven't had that I would I want to learn more about by reading comics about it, because that's how I sort of absorb other people's experiences, or I learn how they see the world. Yeah. Um, while there is maybe a gap in comics, there's a lot of zines about disability right now, um, and there's a lot of queer zines, and as many people who read zines know, that sometimes written word and comics overlap in, in whatever they make. Um, the queer zine archival project, qzap.org, I believe, or .com, I think it's .org, um, is a really good resource, and you can, it's a bunch of queer zines, and you can look by like tag or Whatever. I don't know. Just an idea. Awesome. I, I was going to say anthology, too, because <laughs> that's all I do nowadays. But, yeah. All right. We are done. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs> <laughs>